Welcome to NBA Today. I'm Malika Andrews. We have so much to unpack in this show, including a 50-point night from the Finals MVP and a game winner to cap a career night from one of the hottest players in the league right now. But we have to start with the heavyweight bouts between the top four teams in the East, and we need to start that with the shorthanding Celtics. They went for their eighth season high straight victory win over the ATL. Some headlines from that one. Jalen Brown scored 22 points and Boston got a 126-101 victory, by the way. They're the first team to 12 wins this season. Seven players scored double figures. They made 21 threes. That's nothing new for Boston, though, right? It was the third time this season they've made 20 or more threes in a game. So I want to bring in our friend Vince Carter, an analyst for us NBA folks on ESPN. Vince, what did you make of this one? A very confident Boston Celtics team, Lika. Five guys who average at least three assists or more. They bought into the idea of if we play team ball, we play together, we share it, and let the ball find the open player, we can win games. And then we'll defend. I mean, you look at Jason Tatum, who's averaging four assists. Jalen Brown averaging three assists. And Marcus Smart, who's averaging seven assists. That just sets the tone for how they want to play offensively. I mean, they're they're averaging 120 points per game. That is a confident team, and you can tell what the goal is. They want to get back to the to the uh, NBA Finals and, mm. and finish the job this year. They are playing just like that, as well as their uh, MVP nominee, Jason Tatum. Vince Carter, thank you so much. Please do not go too far, my friend. All right, let's get to another big game in the Easter Conference. It was between two teams that boasted stars averaging 30-plus points per game. You can see them, Donovan Mitchell, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Both teams, though, looking to shake the losing streaks. They were on the Bucks. They were shorthanded. No Drew Holiday, no Chris Middleton, no Pat Connaughton in this one. Giannis scored a season-low 16 points, but still, the Bucks they beat the Cavs 113-98, handing the Cavs their fifth consecutive loss. Brooke Lopez, he showed out against his brother. He and Jordan Nora scored to combine 50 points, hit 12 of Milwaukee's 16 threes in the win. Donovan Mitchell had his eighth straight 20-point game. So let's bring in our friend Kendrick Perkins on this one. Perk, was this game more about the Cavs or Milwaukee? It was more about the Cavs. We already know what we're going to get out of Milwaukee and Giannis Antetokounmpo, especially when they play at home. But Let's talk about the new kid on the block, and that's the Cleveland Cavaliers, hmm. right? A lot of praise since acquiring Donovan Mitchell. We have a lot of praise for Evan Mobley, a lot of praise for Darius Garland, and this team is too good to be on a five-game losing streak right now. And when you look at their team, yes, they're going to fill up the box scores. That could be fool's goal at times. The Cavs have to find a way to start doing the little things that don't show up in the stat sheet, the little things like – getting back in transition, the little things like sinking and filling, helping out one another on the defensive end, tied together like a string for us rotation-wise, and you're not seeing that. We're not seeing active hands and deflections. And until they figure those things out, until they can put other things aside and don't worry about the box score, but worry about what's going to help them win, like diving on the floor, they're going to continue to struggle. And it's unacceptable because they have, they have one of the most talented rosters in the NBA. Hmm. Perk, thank you very much. Please do not go too far. All right, so to recap, top two seeds in the East, they took care of business on the road. But where does that leave their power rankings? For that, I want to turn to ESPN senior writer Zach Lowe. We're, we're a month into the season. The top four spots, power rankings in the East, if you will, how are you diagnosing this? Well, three and four are really, really hard. And you're not going to fool me by putting two Hawks logos there. <laughs> and maybe we need to turn this logo into like a sad face or something instead of the Nets logo. Oh, Zach. I'm grandfathering in, even though they have not played well. Their offense looks sloggy and Joel Embiid has to do everything. I'm grandfathering in the Sixers just okay. on pure talent. I know they're 500. They deserve to be here. Anyone else at three? I mean, just kind of pick who you like. It's like Baskin Robbins. Pick whatever flavor you want. But I'm going <laughs> Cleveland on on a five-game losing streak because I just think the ceiling they've shown hmm. when their four best players are healthy is a little higher than what Atlanta has shown. I'm sorry, Atlanta, and your two logos. You got shellac last night. You're out. But look, the bottom line is between here and here, there is a gigantic gulf. These two teams. Separate these. Been, yeah, they should yeah. be over here yeah. somewhere. Okay. These two teams have been the best teams in the league. And look, you can pick either one for number one. I picked Milwaukee to win the title. They've done this without Chris Middleton, yes. Pat Connaughton, Drew Holiday lately. So I'm going to have to cringe a little bit, put Boston 2 and Milwaukee 1. Milwaukee, come on, Bucks. There you go. Milwaukee 1. Just because just I picked them to win a tie, I got to stick to it. But those two teams, 
they are looking not just head and shoulders, like the whole upper body right. above everybody else. I don't think you can be mad putting the Bucks one, Celtics two. They may flip flop and continue to throughout the rest of the regular season, but I, I hope we get to see that matchup in the Eastern Conference Finals. Some of these teams don't hope that, though. Uh, uh, Miami's gonna, gonna Miami's gonna this have stuff what, to say. Toronto, everyone's gonna have stuff to say. And and the Hawks with their two logos. All right, so that's the top of the East. Let, let's switch gears though to the West and the defending champion Golden State Warriors here, because in case you missed it last night, Steph Curry he. El Fuego on fire, scoring 50 points. He was continuing the offensive tear he's been on. Had 31 in the first half alone. It, it just wasn't enough for the Warriors in the Valley against the Suns. It's the 11th time he's at 50 in his career, but it was only the third time that the Warriors have lost when he's reached that mark. The Warriors fell to 6-9 and nine for the season, 0-8 oh on the road. So take a listen to Steve Kerr after the game. We've got to we got every, get everybody on, on board, on board. You know, on, the, on the same page in terms of just worrying about winning, and that's it. And I think, um, for, you know, for right now anyway, I think we're just scattered. We're, it's a pickup game. Uh, there's no, uh, no execution at either end, no, no sort of uh, commitment to the group. I saw a lot of hanging heads tonight. I think we're feeling sorry for ourselves, and um, nobody's going to feel sorry for us. Um, so uh, everyone can't wait to play us and kick our ass. So the Warriors, they've been the worst team on the road this season. They're allowing more than 124 points per game away from Chase Center, by far the most by any team this season. That's almost 13 more points than when it, what they allow at home. So I want to bring in everybody here, welcoming in Brian Windhorst of the conversation. There's just a ton to dig into. But, Perk, I want to start with you. When you are looking at the Warriors, what is most concerning to you when they are on the road? You know what? <laughs> I sit on here time and time again, and I come on here preaching. I preach about body language. I preach about just looking at guys' actions, the feeling, the camaraderie. And we saw that last night out of the Golden State Warriors. This is the team that actually won the NBA championship last year. They don't have chemistry. The chemistry is gone right now. Now, will they get it back? I don't know, but right now it's not there. If you look at them across the board and watch how they're playing, they're playing a whole bunch of individual basketball. It's not a team anymore. Mm -hmm. It's guys playing with hidden agendas. It was yet, uh, late in the, second, uh, yet in the second half last night. I watched Klay Thompson pull up for two bad shots on, on the other end. If you would watch the body language of Draymond Green along with the body language of Jordan Poole, they're having these problems. And then all of a sudden, you see Jordan Poole and, and, and uh, Andrew Wiggins, they get paid. All of a sudden, they feel like they need a bigger role. But check these two plays out right here. That's one. Clay pull up again. Look at Draymond under the basket. He don't even get back on defense. He's not even interested. Look, he's hanging his head. Steve Kerr pointed it out. He know that he have issues in the locker room. And again, I said this before, when the incident happened with Draymond Green and Jordan Poole, that this is going to be one of the biggest challenges in Steve Kerr's coaching career as the head coach of the Golden State Warriors. And here we are. Brian, I know, uh -huh. I know you were looking at Jordan Poole as well. What stood out to you? Yeah, I'm, I'm listening very closely to what Steve Kerr is saying, and I'm taking under advisement what Perk is just mentioning there. And I do think that there's something there. I think a team that is famous for its chemistry definitely has issues to work through. But the reason that they're struggling with, with you know, surviving Jordan Poole having poor shooting, because the thing about it is, you know, he shot the ball really well in the preseason when he got that contract and when he had the whole punch issue. I think he could just be in a slump. And the reason that they're having a bigger problem dealing with the Jordan Poole slump and dealing with the Clay Thompson down shooting time is because of that defensive, those defensive numbers you showed, Malika. They are not used to being a bottom four defensive team. They're 27th right now. And when you are a bad defensive team, it makes everything harder. It makes going on the road harder. It makes, uh, you know, bad shooting stretches harder. It makes a weaker bench harder. When you can't get stops, it eliminates your margin for error. And the Warriors have been famous for a huge margin for error. And so if they could just start defending better, and that might take a transaction to help their bench, I think a lot of things would improve, potentially including the attitudes in the locker room. Well, and we talk about defensive efficiency. When you say 27th, that's after being second in the league last year, Zach. It's 
it's a, a drop off the likes of which I can never I can never recall. And and this is the whole thing. You can't win road home on Mars. It doesn't matter okay. if you're. By the way, the only teams below them are Houston, San Antonio, and Detroit. I don't think they're really trying to win the title this year. Those three teams. If you're that low on defense, you can't win. They're 24th in defensive rebounding. They can't get a rebound. They're dead last in opponent free throw rate because they're getting blown by at the point of attack time and time again, which means guys are reaching from behind and fouling people. And last night, like Perk said, uncharacteristic communication mm -hmm. breakdowns, losing guys in transition, just not the Warriors. And we can talk about shooting slumps and all that. Until you're not 27th in defense anymore, none of this is going to change. Vince, what are you looking at here? I'm looking at nobody's afraid of the big bad wolf right now. Point blank. You know, Steve Kerr said that everybody wants to play them and kick their behind, and that's really it. Everybody comes out like, hey, you know, we can beat these guys. We can do this. And, and to add to it, the body language, you're seeing head down. You know, and, and so every, when you're losing like this, everything is magnified. You know, if you're winning some games, you really don't notice jo Jordan Poole's slump or Klay Thompson's uh, slump. But winning sweet, you know, kind of cures everything. And right now, they're not doing that. And you're going time and time again on the road mm. where you have to be together as a unit. And you can't do that because it's a bunch of individuals right now, which we do not see often from a team like the Golden State Warriors. Yeah, it was Mark Jackson on the broadcast last night said something interesting. He said, usually when you're looking around, you're seeing guys with their heads down and they don't look very happy. You're going to criticize them more. But Golden State, mm -hmm. they have built up such a body of work that it's like, OK, mm -hmm. maybe we're OK with this. We're going to give them a little bit more benefit of the doubt to have a little bit more time to shake this off. But when your bench scores 17 points and you're 27th in defense, you got to get right real quick. And I think the Golden State Warriors know that. Uh, we still have a lot to go on NBA today. So still ahead, Shea Gilgis. Alexander. I mean, is he the most clutch, clutch player in the league right now? Another game winner last night. We're going to dive into that. Plus, our Adrian Wojnarowski is reporting on the timeline for Kyrie Irving's return. We check in on Brooklyn and hear from Kevin Durant at shoot-around earlier today. And it was Ig's NBA today. All right, let's go coast to coast on last night's action. We're going to start with the Timberwolves. They beat the Magic, who are without Paolo Bancaro. Anthony Edwards had a season-high 35 points, including 19 in the first quarter. Perk, step in the right direction for the T-Wolves. Oh, please, Malik, I am not going to give a, uh, a plot of fish for swimming. Look, they beat the Cleveland Cavaliers <laughs> with, with three starters out, and then they beat the, uh, the Magic last night without their best player. So I don't want to hear it, but look, you got to start somewhere, but at the end of the day, don't we expect the Timberwolves to win this game? We had high hopes for them, so I'm not impressed. I'm going to use that fish swimming line later. All right, on to the Hornets. Uh, they lost to the Pacers. They're now 1-9 and nine over their last 10 games. LaMelo Ball had a season-high 26 points, but you could see he rolled his ankle, stepped on a fan sitting courtside in the final minutes. It was just his third game back, already ruled out for tonight. Brian, how concerned are you about this? They have had nothing go right for them this year, Malika. Yeah. And right when they break their eight-game losing streak, they're, you're getting LaMelo, or, uh, LaMelo back into rhythm, and now he's going to be out. He's probably going to be out for more than just the game against the Cavs on Friday night. He may miss several games. This is obviously a concern. Without LaMelo, they have no explosion on offense. Let's get to the Knicks. Julius Randle led the Knicks to a road victory over the Nuggets, who were without Nikola Jokic. Randle had a season-high 34 points. The Knicks got their first win in Denver since 2006. By the way, that snaps a 14-game losing streak. Zach, how big of a win was this for New York? Big. They caught a break without Jokic playing, but you know what? you got to take advantage of your breaks, and the Knicks are on a long road trip and entering like a 12- or 13-game period that is just hellish on their schedule. They, they entered it with a bad loss to the Thunder, a bad loss to the Nets. These are big stability wins. And lastly, the Thunder. They beat the Wizards on a game-winning three by Shea Gilgis-Alexander with just over a second left in the game. Shea continued just an excellent start to the season, matching a career-high 42 points. SGA led the Thunder to a surprising 7-8 and eight start this season. SGA is on pace to join Steph Curry as the only players in the NBA history to average 30 points per game on 50-40-90 shooting. Steph did it back in 2015-20. 16 win. I think you guys remember what happened that year. Oh, yeah, he won unanimous MVP, is doing it all again this year. We're going to get to SGA a little bit later in the show because he's been incredible. But turning the page to SGA's former team, the Clippers, I want to bring in ESPN senior insider Adrian Wojnarowski. Woj, what is the latest on Kawhi Leonard's return from injury management? Yeah, Malika, it appears Kawhi Leonard will make his return tonight against the Detroit Pistons. The Clippers upgraded him. Uh, to questionable this morning, which is typically 
uh, the progression you see on a game day uh, when, for a player who's been out uh, for a significant significant period like Leonard. Uh, he hasn't played since October 23rd. He's only played two games this year uh, for uh, the Clippers. And certainly they're always going to be careful, especially uh, coming off such a long absence after missing last season uh, with the knee injury. But now uh, he's on the brink of his return for a team that's eight and seven without him, still just two and a half games out uh, in the West. And so for a Clipper team, you know, to get Kawhi Leonard back, uh, to get their core group on the floor uh, and be able to start building some con continuity uh, as they head toward the postseason. Obviously, you know, they don't want to uh, have a situation where Kawhi Leonard, you know, plays just, you know, so few regular season games uh, with the hope of getting uh, right for the playoffs. They want him on the floor a lot in the regular season, and it appears you know, they take a step toward that tonight against the Pistons. Woj, thank you so much. I appreciate that. We will see you in just a little bit later in the show. Of course, Kawhi Leonard has missed 12 straight games. I do want to bring Zach Lowe back into this conversation. Zach, Kawhi Leonard coming back here for the Clippers. Our Adrian Wojnarowski reporting he is on the precipice of doing so. What does that mean for this L.A. team? As Woj said, they need to establish their chemistry and their identity. They cannot do the thing they did in their first year together where they just sort of screw around with the regular season and say, oh, we don't have any chemistry. They need to build chemistry. But look, eight and seven, they've held the fort without him, without, without some other guys here and there in games. I think that's impressive, but they just haven't gelled quite yet, particularly on offense where they've struggled all season, been in the bottom five. They need to start figuring out how do they play uh, with certain lineup combinations, whether it's John Wall or Reggie Jackson at the point guard, what their style is going to be. And this is he's the centerpiece of it, so they need him. The Clippers, they take on the Detroit Pistons tonight. Still to come on NBA Today, Woj is back. He joins us with the latest reporting on Kyrie's return to the court. And we will also hear from Kevin Durant. He spoke this morning at shoot-around ahead of the Nets game against the Blazers. Plus, who has the I, My apologies, <laughs> sir. You were right. You told me. When, when Kevin Durant says that, that's a wow to me for him to say that publicly. So as we continue to examine the current state of the Nets and the layers of the issues at hand, we're once again joined by senior NBA insider Adrian Wojnarowski with the latest on Kyrie's suspension. Woj, tonight Kyrie is going to miss his eighth consecutive game in Portland. What can you tell us about when we may expect him to return? Yeah, Malik, uh, Kyrie Irving's return, uh, I'm told, looms on Sunday against Memphis back at the Barclays Center. There's still steps here in the next day or so that Kyrie Irving uh, is uh, completing as part of his process to return from this suspension. Uh, but I think there's uh, preparations in place and an expectation, you know, that barring some, uh, some sort of a setback here in any way, uh, that Kyrie Irving uh, will, will end up missing eight games and potentially now return on Sunday against Memphis. In your reporting, Woj, on ESPN.com, you laid out how this path to return has been agreed upon. It's not simply checking off a list of items. How has it been shaped? Yeah, and uh, Malik, I, I think the Players Association played a, a big role in that. Uh, Tamika Tremelio, the executive director and their group uh, in New York, and trying to bridge the, the conversation between uh, the league, the Nets, and Kyrie Irving, and and instead of, and I think this is something the league wanted. I think this is something the Nets wanted, which was Kyrie Irving to to, to take what he felt were some meaningful steps and some ideas of his own uh, about how to go forward. And you know, I'm told a lot of that has been implemented. It wasn't a, a simply a checklist given to him by the team, uh, by the league. And so I think the union played a big part uh, in, in helping to kind of bridge that I think some people talked early on about would there be uh, a grievance filed you know based on how you know I think unprecedented the the ask was of Kyrie Irving this is an unprecedented situation in a lot of ways and I think a, a grievance or something formal in that way I don't think there could have been a resolution quick enough mm. uh, to get Kyrie Irving uh, uh, out of a five game suspension I think the process that they put in place I think has got them almost to the finish line now and and uh, Kyrie Irving back on the court 
uh, perhaps as soon as Sunday for Brooklyn. And for everyone at home, you can check out Woj's reporting on ESPN.com. There is so much more there. Woj, thank you so much for joining us. The Nets, they're 4-3 and three without Irving. He's averaging just under 27 points per game. And Kevin Durant spoke about his impending return at shoot-around this morning. It's exciting for everybody. I mean, this guy, this person is out there on the floor. Um, you know, hopefully soon. I mean, I haven't talked to him. Joined once again by Zach Lowe and Brian Windhorst will be by in just a moment. The Nets, though, they, they're six and nine. Kevin Durant is the only player this season scoring 25 or more points in every game that he has played in. How are you looking at this Nets team right now and Kevin Durant specifically? So if they're six and nine and four and three with Kyrie, I think that makes or without Kyrie, I think it makes them two and six with Kyrie. Look, the Nets are just not playing well. They're they're a losing team. Ben Simmons, the third member of their big three, is now, I guess, officially a backup center. And it just feels like it's not gonna happen. I mean, why what has happened in the last four years to suggest to anyone that once this suspension is over, well, it's all just smooth sailing from here. The Kyrie will play 60 more games. The Nets will be fine. There will be no drama. Everything will be great. The team will reach its potential, and everyone will be happy. There is nothing, nothing in the track record that suggests that will happen. There's going to be something else because there's always something else. And to me, the only thing left that matters now is that guy right there, mm. Kevin Durant, still one of the three or four best players in the league at worst and the entire league. All the teams who were looking at him over the summer when, by the way, he requested a trade not long ago. Some of them won't get into it this time. Some will. Other teams that weren't in it at that, at that time, they're looking and waiting and seeing because he's one of the few players in the world who tips the entire balance of power of the league with him. And so I, I, I don't know for there. I don't know if the Nets will get there this year, if Kevin Durant will get there this year, but it just feels inevitable to me. And certainly eyebrows were raised this week, right, when you look at what Kevin Durant said to Bleacher Report when he's talking about the construction of this team. That's when sort of the league starts to go, oh, okay, well, what's going on here, Brian? How are you reading this? You know, I think what Kevin said is a great window into what's actually going on with the Nets. He said... Listen, I'm having a, a good time right now playing basketball. This is what I love to do. And I, I think that that's absolutely true. You know, I think that Kevin, you know, pr you know his, his happy place is just playing. And um, that has all kinds of rewards that has happened throughout his career. I think his legacy is actually spectacular. Anybody who wants to attack his legacy, I really think is being unfair. Um, and, but when he says he's having a good time and just enjoying playing basketball with this group, it underscores what part of the issue with the Nets is, and that there's not that much accountability. Kevin Durant should not be having a good time right now. He should be furious at what's happened with Kyrie Irving. He should be furious that his team doesn't defend better. I mean, they did defend okay for a three or four game stretch after Kyrie was suspended. That's why they got a couple of wins. But Anthony Davis had the best game of his career against or of, of this season against them over the weekend. And then this, the, the, the Kings went through them like Swiss cheese defensively the other day because they just can't defend. So, but I have to tell you, Malika, I'm I'm not expecting after 16 years Kevin Durant to all of a sudden change his mentality and come out there and start pounding on on the on the floor and saying we got to absolutely you know man up because that's not who he is. He is going to show up tonight. He is going to play well. That's what he does. But I don't expect him to affect change because that's not who the player he has been. And next week we have a huge game with the Nets going back to Philadelphia. That's going to be drama central. Ooh. I expect Kevin Durant to handle it great. I have no idea how his team is going to handle it. Well, you mentioned that game against Philly. Let's take a look at the Nets' upcoming schedule. Our Adrian Wojnarowski once again reporting that Kyrie Irving could be back with this team, is expected to be back with this team, as soon as Sunday against the Grizzlies. But you can see the road doesn't necessarily get easy for them from here. So I want to bring Vince Carter and Kendrick Perkins back into this conversation because both of you gentlemen have been in locker rooms dealing with these various different issues. Issues, adding players, subtracting players, chemistry seems to be at the core of what we're talking about here. Perk, what are you expecting Kyrie Ir with Kyrie Irving uh, returning to this Nets group? It, I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know. And that's and fair. It, it's right. not just Kyrie Irving returning. Yeah. It, it's not just Kyrie Irving returning to the group, but it's Kevin Durant comments that he made about you know, uh, who he was playing with, who he's on the floor with, and 
how do they expect to win any the, in the games, right? So it's it's everything, and it's everything surrounding this whole entire locker room. It's it's everything to the attention that Kyrie is going to bring back on the team when he do get back uh, to playing, and guys having to ask uh, answer questions. And then again, it's going to shift for a moment of it not being about basketball and and how is Kyrie Irving and where is the chemistry. So the answer is. I really don't know. I never had to deal with this problem, but I didn't have to deal with things internally about guys complaining about not getting the basketball, guys worrying about their contract, or guys worrying about getting traded. We, I have never had to deal with anything to this magnitude, and I feel sorry for the young guys in the locker room, like Claxton, like Cam Thomas, like the kids Summers, who have to deal with all this and not just have to worry about their job, and that's playing the game of basketball. Vince? Uh, yeah, I mean, Perk is right. It's like I, I feel like, like, like Wendy said, he he just wants to play basketball, and we all feel it. Yes, he should be furious, which I think he is. He's frustrated, but I, I I think the dynamic is he doesn't. He just wants to hoop, and he doesn't want to answer questions about somebody else, you know, and their situation. But he, you know, he just wants to win. And how can you fix it? I don't know. I mean, I, I've been the vet in the locker room before, where yeah, my ver my voice. Uh, it, you know, carries my voice. I was always in guys and you know, motivating. And he's a guy that leads by example. And I said it before, the way they're going to, you know, kind of get out of this slump and help Jacques Vaughn is by leading by example. And he's trying to do that. And he doesn't have a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. So he's not telling a lie. Mm. He's not telling a lie. But like you said, Perk, it's like you're looking at young guys and they're like, all right, so what am I to do? I'm trying. I'm doing this. It's just it's just the reality. And the hand that they're dealt with is not a good one right now. Well, Kevin Durant did tell reporters that he thinks that it's not going to take Kyrie Irving that long for him to get back in a rhythm. It may take a quarter or two, but he's looking forward to having him back out on the floor. Our Adrian Wojnarowski reporting that that could come as soon as this weekend when the Nets return home against the Memphis Grizzlies. All right, coming up on NBA Today, Vince Carter once said that there are levels to this. So see which dunk reached that level. That's next on The Upper Room. Zach, I'm going to win this week. I feel it in my boots. I feel no, it. No, you're not. I'm yes, going to win.